Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. The entire Constitution will be applicable. We've got that story plus Chinese manimal hybrids. But first, we are all enemies of the state, draconian laws, pre-crime, and surveillance state. Fantastic piece by John Whitehead up on Rutherford.org. It begins by noting that H.L. Mencken said, The whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed, and hence clamorous to be led to safety, by an endless series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. We've been down this road many times before. If the government's consistent about anything, it is this. It is the unnerving tendency to exploit crises and use them as opportunities. Yeah, never let a crisis go to waste. For power grabs under the guise of national security. Q, the emergency state. The government's Machiavellian version of crisis management that justifies all manner of government tyranny in the so-called name of national security. Terrorist attacks, mass shootings, unforeseen economic collapse, loss of functioning political and legal order, purposeful domestic resistance or insurgency, pervasive public health emergencies, catastrophic natural human disasters. The government's been anticipating and prepping for crises for years now. It's all part of the grand plan for control. Government's proposed response to the latest round of mass shootings in the U.S. over this last weekend, red flag gun laws, pre-crime surveillance, fusion centers, threat assessments, mental health assessments, involuntary confinement, pretty much more of the same. These tactics have been employed before here in the U.S. and elsewhere by other totalitarian regimes with devastating results. It's a simple enough formula. First, you create fear, then you capitalize on it by seizing power. In his remarks on the mass shootings in Texas and Ohio, President Trump promised to give the FBI whatever they need to investigate and disrupt hate crimes and domestic terrorism. Is that the same FBI of Crooked Comey and the Mueller witch hunt? James, I saw a video from just a couple of days ago where a motorcycle backfired in Times Square in, in New York City and people freaked out. Does it kind of feel like we're back in the kind of Bush era of paranoia, James? Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up, actually, because I was just reflecting how it, just a decade, decade and a half ago, when we were still living under the magical terror spell of LCA and 9-11, uh, the, one of the... One of the ideas that was floating around at that time is there was going to be mass shootings at malls. That was one of the ideas that was floating around in the zeitgeist after 9-11. That was going to be the next wave of terror attacks. Well, I'm not sure about the... Well, sometimes at malls, but sometimes at random other places, garlic festivals and what have you. Uh, mass shootings is becoming such a, a part of the public psyche that a backfire in Times Square will cause a mass stampede of people. So uh, we are pretty much there at the engineered... Um, state of being in perpetual fear to the terror boogeyman. This time it's not the al Qaeda terror boogeyman per se. This time it's the conspiracy theorist terror boogeyman that of course the FBI is warning us about because conspiracy theorists might be motivated to commit violent acts and lo and behold we're starting to see that oh these uh, these mass shooters there they posted on HN they they did this they did that and they're trying to link it all of course to radicalization on the web so this is a particularly scary time I'm not sure we have seen anything quite like this even back in the post 9/11 terror hysteria I think there was at least at that time it was one sort of contained, idea. It was al Qaeda, and they were attacking us for our freedom or whatever it was, and that was motivating the wars overseas and the domestic clampdown at home. Now it's this entire melange of, of uh, radicalization on the web and conspiracy theorists and domestic terrorists, and uh, they can strike anywhere, anytime kind of thing. And that is empowering a lot of very important conversations in the United States. And honestly, it's one of those times when I reflect it's nice to be living an ocean away from the United States and the craziness and bedlam that's going on there. Although I say that knowing that whatever bedlam and chaos uh, inflicts the U.S. body politic will travel around the world very shortly. So, uh, you know, this is a scary time. And these are the types of stories we're going to be, I have no doubt, seeing more and more in the near future. Well, and so much of this is, and I talk about this a lot on my show, a lot of this is really the copycat effect. It is that sort of echo chamber repeating event that makes all this happen. James, I've been diving back into a little bit of, of actually Columbine research and the fantastic documentary by Evan Long, The Columbine Calls, which is stunningly still up on YouTube right there for everybody. That was pretty much the, the peak part of a lot of the shooter postal events of the 90s 
wiped off the page by, of course, the events of 9-11 where things kind of morphed. Now they're sort of putting things back onto the plate and it's all kind of piling up more and more and more. Like you've even just said on some of your recent shows, we're now almost nearly back to the point of having to talk about this stuff by word of mouth because all the web, all the structures, all the things that we've used to, of course, stunning success over the last decade have all pretty much been ripped out from under us. Um, John Whitehead actually wrote a bit about a lot of what we're seeing again because we're the conspiracy theorists. We're the terrorists, whether you're a far right conspiracy theorist or a far left conspiracy theorist. Again, the, the phony left right paradigm still works. The rise of the American Gestapo. So John Whitehead wrote about this right before our recent American weekend of murder and mayhem. It's pretty much about the alphabet agencies, how they not only brought over the Nazis for help on Space Force, but how the FBI, CIA, etc. have openly adopted the tactics of the Gestapo. And again, what, what do people say? Yeah, lock those other people up, but not me. So that's pretty much what's going on here in the shattered North American Union. Let's see what's going on in the larger Brave New World Order here for segment two on episode 382 of New World next week. This is for August 8th, 2019, and it is Kashmir Crisis. Now, James, I saw something about this, of course, earlier in the week. I just saw Article 370, Article 370, and it didn't make any sense to me. So I'm glad we're putting this on the table today. India scraps special status for Kashmir in steps Pakistan calls illegal. India revoked the special status of Kashmir, the Himalayan region that's long been a flashpoint in ties with neighboring Pakistan, moving to grasp its only Muslim-majority region more tightly. This is coming from Reuters, and again, everything we say will always be included in the show notes. In the most far-reaching, so this again, this is coming from Reuters, in the most far-reaching political move in one of the world's most militarized regions in nearly seven decades, India said it would scrap a constitutional provision that allowed the states of Jammu and Kashmir to make their own laws. The entire constitution will be applicable to Jammu and Kashmir, Interior Minister told the parliament, as opposition lawmakers voiced loud protests against the repeal. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged India and Pakistan, which also claims Kashmir, to pretty much chill. The U.S. State Department, a.k.a. the lying frontman Pompeo, said they were closely following the events and said without a shred of bloody irony that they're really concerned over reports of detentions. Pakistan said it strongly condemned the decision, which is bound to further strain ties between the nuclearly armed rivals. A political professor there said, quote, the scrapping of Article 370 of the Constitution is likely to set off a slew of political constitutional and legal battles not to speak of the battles on the streets of Kashmir. James? This is an incredibly important story and I'd like to give a hats off to Home Remedy Supply in the CorbettReport.com comment section for pointing me in this direction. I hadn't seen this story till he posted it in the comments so that was very helpful and this is such an important story that I, I'm afraid a lot of people who don't follow this won't really grasp how really important this is. But uh, just as an update uh, from the Pakistani Daily Times, India's lower house ratifies bill to split IHK, noting that the Lok, Lok Sabha, the lower house of Indian parliament, on Tuesday evening passed the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Bill 2019 with 367 votes for, 67 against, and non-abstaining, which is going to split the Jammu and Kashmir into two federally managed territories rather than one, which it had been up to this point. So everything is changing right now. This is a huge move in an incredibly sensitive region that I have written about before in the forecaster uh, just recently on false flags over Kashmir, where I was talking about the, uh, the, the military tensions that were taking place between India and Pakistan over the Kashmir region at that time. Well, it's just gotten inflamed to a much greater degree. So for people who want more information specifically about this Jammu and Kashmir reorganization bill and what all of this means, I will point them to a very, very no-nonsense bullet point uh, article from insightonindia.com that explains uh, some detail of what's going on and why it matters. Um, I think there are three different angles that we can approach this from. One is the legal ang angle, um, specifically talking about the constituent assembly versus the legislative assembly and some rewording that's taken place in uh, in terms of the legal governance of that region over the past year and how that's playing into what's happening now and now there's going to be supreme court challenges to the legality of this reorganization so we'll see how that plays out of course the other angle or an another angle is the geopolitical angle and we get uh, that from a couple of 
angles. One, of course, Pakistan, who, of course, has a Pakistani-administered region uh, in the in the area. And now we have Pakistani PM uh, Imran Kurt Khan warning that a war could break out between the two nuclear-armed powers, specifically because India's move could trigger attacks by Kashmiris against Indian soldiers stationed in Kashmir, and that India would likely blame Pakistan for those attacks. So... We see how, again, false flags over Kashmir, how these types of incidents can balloon out in all sorts of ways. And another player in the region that uh, does a butt against the region and does have its own interest is China. And now we have a statement from the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman say, a spokeswoman saying India's action is unacceptable and would not have any legal effect. And India saying back, hey, butt out, this is an internal domestic issue when it clearly is not. Um, I mean, this is clearly a region changing sort of issue. And let's stress once again, we have not one, not two, but three nuclear powers right there at the cusp of this region that all have their own stakes and interests in maintaining some sort of status quo. That status quo has just been completely eliminated from the table. The other, the third angle that we could look at it from is the one that's generally neglected here. How about the Kashmiris themselves? What are they experiencing? What do they think about this? The answer is we don't know because the entire region has been on a complete communication lockdown for the past couple of days. Um, you, you need curfew passes to go out. Uh, the Indian military is now there locking down the region. A really interesting um, personal take on this from uh, Shah, Shah Faisal is up on the wire.in where you can get a lot of information on this subject. And uh, he wrote about everything has been lost except our resolve to fight back. And it's talking about the incredible lockdown that's taking place right now and what that looks like on the ground. So definitely worth checking out those resources. But this is only scraping the surface. I will obviously be writing about this in greater detail in the forecaster this weekend. So please stay tuned for that. Again, I cannot stress how important this is geopolitically what's going on right now. This is one of the biggest moves in one of the most sensitive regions in the world for decades. Yeah, James. Uh, again, all, all I sort of saw was Ar- Article 370, and it didn't it didn't make any sense to me. So I'm glad you brought this to the table, indeed. So speaking of battles on the streets and most favored nation, one quick related before we move to segment three: Chinese state media blames CIA for violent Hong Kong protests. To say nothing, of course, of what's still going on in France as well. Our third and final story here on New World Next Week, James, this is sometimes where we put just the WTF story, and this is a good one. First, human monkey chimera raises concern among scientists, this coming from The Guardian. Efforts to create human-animal chimeras have rebooted an ethical debate after reports emerged that scientists have produced monkey embryos containing human cells. Now, as The Guardian helpfully points out, a chimera is an organism whose cells come from two or more individuals with some of this recent work looking at combinations from different species. The word comes from a beast of Greek mythology, which was said to be part lion, part goat, and part snake. The latest report published in the Spanish newspaper El País claims a team of researchers led by Professor Belmonte from the Salk Institute, named after that famed pharma eugenicist Jonas Salk, in the U.S. So the, the institute is in the U.S., and that's where they work. And those guys have produced monkey-human chimeras. However... The research was conducted in China to avoid legal issues. Details of this work being reported are scarce, as Belmonte and colleagues did not respond to requests for comment. The news of the monkey-human chimeras comes shortly after it was reported, as I went over it on my morning show this morning. Japanese researchers, such as Professor Hiromitsu Nakuchi, received government support to create mouse-human chimeras, as they've recently overturned a ban on some of that stuff going on in Japan, where I believe the the halt was was 14 days and, and nothing further. We'll include that link to the original report on El País. They seem to have their own English translation. Spanish scientists create human monkey chimera in China. And that related one, scientists get green light to create human-animal hybrids in Japan. So, James, it's, it's not just the U.S. via most favored nation. You're going to have some in your own backyard there as well. Yes. Uh, very worrying development. And uh, you can look at this at the surface level or the deeper level. Even the surface level of this is uh, worrying enough because it represents a furthering of an overall agenda to lower the value of the status of human life and what it means. And I say that because 
what is going on here, at least what they're telling the public and the way they're framing this is, this will be perfect for growing organs for people who need transplants. And the, specifically, uh, the Nature.com article on Japan approves first animal hum, uh, human animal embryo experiments lays out the process that they're trying to do. But in a nutshell, in 2017, Nakauchi and his colleagues reported the injection of mouse IPS cells, that's induced pluripotent stem cells, into the embryo of a rat that was unable to produce a pancreas. The rat formed a pancreas made entirely of mouse cells. Nakauchi and his team transplanted that pancreas back into a mouse that had been engineered to have diabetes. The rat-produced organ, the rat-produced mouse pancreas, was able to control blood sugar levels, effectively curing the mouse of diabetes. So there you go. That's kind of the holy grail of what they're going for. And ultimately, it's going to be, well, not a mouse uh, pancreas in, grown in a rat. It's going to be a human heart grown in a pig or whatever the equivalent is. And so they're trying to figure out, oh, we can just precisely engineer it so that this pig would be naturally missing its heart. So all the human cells will go to the heart and create a human heart within this pig. And then we can harvest that heart. That's sort of the goal of this. But as many researchers are pointing out, you know, it's not necessarily going to go quite so, so well. And the human cells might develop in other places. And there's nothing to say that, for example, brain cells, human brain cells won't form, that will form a human consciousness in this monstrosity hybrid. And essentially, you will have some form of human or proto-human, quasi-human slaves that are being harvested for their organs. Absolute, total, sci-fi, nightmare, monster reality that they are trying to bring to fruition right now. And I say trying to bring to fruition because this is, again, what we know in the public. But as we know, there are experiments going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. For example, recently came up with that uh, Chinese scientist that was doing that uh, jiggery pokery with, uh, with uh, Chinese babies and editing babies and what have you. We don't really know, and we probably won't know. And there are, of course, always the claims going around in the conspiracy circles that they have entire engineered, you know, human-animal hybrids that, you know, live in labs and whatever. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have the inside sources on that, but it wouldn't necessarily be out of the realm of possibility for that stuff to be going on behind the scenes. But again, as I say, this is about lowering the value of human life itself. And uh, to, to think nothing of the animal cruelty that is implicit in harvesting a being, a living being, just for a, an organ, but then throwing in the human dimension to it. Well, it's kind of human as well. Uh, it's truly horrific. And it's the kind of thing that people can only probably get, grasp in some sort of narrative form. There has to be some sort of science fiction, you know, that has explored this issue, but I don't know it off the top of my head. If anyone does, please let us know in the comment section, because I think this is an issue that people really have to think out the implications to really grasp what's going on here. Pigman, Jerry. Pigman. One last blast of uh, late summer fun here, James, as we wrap up this New World Next Week episode with a, a couple of updates on things that we've been tracking on recent New World Next Week episodes. CDC shuts down all high-level research at Fort Detrick. You know, the, the place where Bruce Ivins was making all that anthrax that got out. They shut down all the high-level research, all the stuff dealing, you know, with Ebola and plague, the, the fears that it might get released via wastewater. That is the CDC shutting down Fort Detrick because, oh, uh, you might flush plague down the toilet. Uh, another news that, that I think goes along with our, you know, the weaponized tick story from a couple of weeks ago. And again, and I'm anxiously waiting to see if anything will come of that. New York resident dies after contracting Powassan. This is a new one. A rare tick-borne illness. So we'll continue to watch all of that gnarly stuff as the summer of rage rages on, James. I always like to tell folks I stream news, music, memes, and more at Media Monarchy. But I also want to tell folks I'm going to take next week off. I'll take next week off also from New World next week because it's my birthday. As I usually take off a bit of time here, James. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to you again in two weeks. And until then, uh, take care. Thanks, buddy.